Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to open uh, hearing nine of the 184th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission of uh, Human Rights, which is titled Access to Justice and Stereotypes and uh, Gender Stereotypes in the Region, which was um, convened by the Inter-American Commission considering the importance of this issue for access to justice and reparation, and also to analyze the guarantees of due process. My name is Julissa Mantilla. I'm the president of the commission. I'm Rapporteur for the Rights of Women. I'm here with the second vice president, Commissioner Margaret Mac McCauley, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemeno, Rapporteur for Children's Rights, and also Commissioner Roberta Clark, Rapporteur for uh, for the Rights of LGBTIQ Persons. Also, we have Maria Claudia Polido with us. A greeting to the civil society and welcome to this hearing. I want to explain the distribution of time. We will have a first intervention by the civil society for 55 minutes by Laura Clerico first, and then we'll have some questions and comments on the part of the Inter-American Commission so that then the civil society can reply for 15 minutes. So having said this, I give the floor to Dr. Laura Clerico so that she may begin with the intervention. Good, every, good afternoon, good morning. I greet the Honorable Commission, its president, the rapporteurships present today, and I celebrate this conv uh, convening this hearing by the commission because uh, gender stereotypes and access to justice is still a very necessary and urgent issue. During my presentation, I will argue that the use of gender stereotypes has to be addressed from four dimensions and also taking into account that the Inter-American that there is a suggestion for the Inter-American Commission to draft a thematic report on the use of gender stereotypes. So these areas are conceptual, material, methodological, and uh, remedial aspects. These dimensions allow us to see the achievements on the matter and also to present the pending issue so that no one is left behind. The conceptual area refers to what we understand as gender stereotypes. We have had a great achievement. We have identified a consolidated standards of gender stereotypes, which arises from the Commission and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, from the uh, cotton field uh, um, case onwards. This stereotype is a preconception of attributes or roles that should be executed by women and men, respectively, and continues to point out this definition, which is possibly to, which is that it is possible to associate women to socially domineering uh, activities, which is worsened when there is a reflection in policies and practices, particularly in terms of reasoning and the wording of uh, justice operators. And in Manuela case, in paragraph 163, it is added that the use of gender stereotypes on the part of justice authorities in their issuing may constitute uh, an element that indicates the lack of bias, of impartiality. This ad was a very uh, expected one and must be made visible. Maybe this is a challenge in terms of concept, which is working on combined stereotypes, because if we review different rulings, we will see that gender stereotypes come with a uh, aspects related to Afro-descendants, persons, poverty, and age. Now, in terms of material dimension, there is a second great achievement, the obligation of not creating stereotypes, which is part of the obligation to eradicate all forms of dic discrimination against women and adolescents. This arises from, the, from Article 1, 
of the Commission's constitution is part of the jurisprudence and is supported by rulings from the Belém do Pará Convention, from CEDAW, and from the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The great challenge here is to relate and make visible the fact that the obligation to not create gender stereotypes is related to the conception of structural inequality developed in thematic reports by the Inter-American Commission. That is, it is necessary to make visible that there is a structure that expresses, that is expressed by uh, gender stereotypes. This is related to patriarch, patriarchal system, male chauvinism and uh, exploitation by the system. So this leads us to the need to dismantle gender stereotypes and it's related to the methodological aspect, which has to be executed by judges, magistrates, in order to not create stereotypes. On the one hand, there is an obligation upon those persons. They should not be led by gender stereotypes that are not compatible with international law on human rights. And in order to do that, it's key that when they address a case, they have to think about it on under the terms related to uh, persons that are in structural inequality situations. So this should be there should be a systematic reading on the thematic reports by the commission because they are always thinking of contexts and not of victims. So if you if we get to achieve this, it's more uh, probable that there are no gender stereotypes on the file. And then we should see how this impacts the interpretation of the facts of the motivation of the sentence and the determination of reparations and guarantees of non-repetition. And finally, this is key, we have to ask ourselves how the damage caused by the use of gender stereotypes, which is not compatible with international law on human rights, it impacts disproportionately on the on the situation of the uh, society uh, persons that are already in structural inequality. This leads me to guarantees of non-repetitions. This many times is combined with Afro-descendants uh, uh, belonging to indigenous communities poverty. These are all expressions of structural and intersectional poverty. So this is why we require that those reparations and guarantees of non-repetition be transformative of those structures, which continue to be the cause and the consequence of the use of gender stereotypes. Of course, as you may imagine, I cannot uh, delve deeper into each of the recommendations, but I am interested in, in explaining those who have to do with the selection of judges. On the one hand, it's still pending on the region, the under-representation of women judges at the court, at the uh, general attorney's office as well. So we have to support the action of organizations that work to get to achieve this and also to think of positive measure measures on the one on the other hand we require judges or actually uh, those who aspire who are candidates to be judged they should also credit gender perspective inclusion we also have best practices in the region they should prove that they have completed courses and when they are evaluated, they should be assessed with cases in which they have to include gender perspective. This is why we highlight there that the hearings for selection must be public. Otherwise we cannot monitor what is happening in, those, in that selection process. 
Lastly, I would like to suggest the Inter-American Commission to include in its agenda the drafting of a thematic report on the analysis of gender stereotypes and also in an annex maybe that it may gather all the protocols that have been developed in the region as regards the inclusion of gender perspective. Lastly, in order to conclude my intervention, I would like to emphasize that we require making visible the use of gender stereotypes that are not incompatible that are not compatible with international law and that this is an indicator of a new violation of one of the pillars of the justice system which is the guarantee of justice impartiality thank you very much and with this i give the floor to my colleague lilan arrieta who will be speaking on on this Thank you very much, Lara, for this marvelous intervention. I, it's a pity that I'm not your student, but I still have time. Well, thank you, Madam President and other commissioners and staff of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It's a pleasure to be at this historical hearing as Commissioner Julissa said at first, my name is Ilia Marrieta. I'm the country rapporteur of Abogados Sin Fronteras Canada. We're working on a project to improve access to justice for uh, gender-based violence victims. And this is why we will we were able to find many uh, rulings that judges issue uh, resolutions with gender stereotypes. This is extremely uh, important for El Salvador because two out of three women has suffered gender-based violence. 66% of women have suffered violence throughout their lives, and many of these attacks are sexually based. 24 sexual assaults were uh, registered, registered by day in 2021 but less than 6% of those uh, make a report. One of the reasons why this is so is the fear for not being uh, believed. And this is relately, uh, di directly related to what uh, my colleague just explained. Many times judges use gender stereotypes on their decisions, which becomes judgment of the victims instead of having a judgment of the facts and the attackers. This. Uh, makes uh, reports not uh, happen because, and also when judges saw resolve cases based on gender stereotypes, they are being unbiased. And this affects that pillar of jurisdiction, which is the uh, justice and in independence. Violence victims, different women and diversities who have suffered gender-based violence that face judges that rule with these stereotypes are not being judged by unbiased judges. In El Salvador, we have seen many cases and we have cited three cases. I will not repeat this because we are not uh, we're very short in time, but I would like to point out a case of a journalist that was harassed by a politician when she came before the judge, the female judge. This judge absolved the attacker and told the journalist that she should be used to this type of situations uh, due to her work. Of course, for the majority of the population, this was really unacceptable to have this reasoning. Also, there has been cases of judges who have absolved men of over 50 years because they have considered that a victim, a 10-year-old kid, was going voluntarily towards her uh, attacker. This is horrifying. This is not foreign to the commission. As Laura Clerico was mentioning, in the case of Manuela, there was work on this issue in a transversal way. This was um, a marriage reports that mentions gender stereotypes and the, what, how it affects access to justice. This 
has an influence on the on the assessment of the evidence and also what's uh, this the most serious aspect and this it comes from the case Manuela versus El Salvador there is an assumption a tacit assumption on the responsibility of the of the victim I also ask the drafting of a thematic report on this issue because El Salvador is a proof that the situation is extremely serious. There is no access for vic uh, to justice for victims, and it's also affecting the guarantee of an unbiased judge. And now we have the Women's League representatives next. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to greet the commissioners and its executive secretariat. My name is Lucia Hernandez. I will be covering two situations regarding the use of gender stereotypes in access to justice by women who suffer discrimination. Um, Dr. Clerico already talked about um, some of these stereotypes. First, I would like to talk about the barriers faced by migrant women to, due to gender stereotypes. In Colombia, we have identified the use of some gender stereotypes by judicial authorities in order to uh, prevent access to the voluntary um, um, to voluntary um, abortion. Also, sometimes these preconceived ideas by judicial authorities do not compromise a judicial impartiality, but in the case of migrant women, imply additional barriers that also affect their socioeconomic situation, especially for reproductive age women due to the differentiated impacts of the um, humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Women's Link would like to highlight the importance of applying an intersectional perspective to understand the differentiated impacts of all gender stereotypes on migrant women. We also would like to talk about the situation of migrant women that are victims of human trafficking in Colombia. Um, in 2021, there was a ruling by the Constitutional Court that illustrates how gender stereotypes affect migrant women who are victims of human trafficking seeking justice in the country. They cannot access the legal remedies that exist in order to guarantee their rights. I'm talking about Yolanda, a Venezuelan woman who traveled to Colombia together with her family after receiving a deceiving job offer. And she ended up being a victim of sexual exploitation. Yolanda went to the authorities to report what had happened to her. However, the state did not have any attention network for her because um, consider that it was just a crime of prostitution. Sometimes victims of human trafficking uh, suffer um, some gender stereotypes, which are reinforced by the actions of the state. Venezuelan women are hypersexualized and they are related to sex work without taking any consideration for the conditions in which or to which they are subjected. We have ruling of the Constitutional Court, which recognized those failures and requested justice for Yolanda and also structural changes in the state in order to guarantee protocols to guarantee access to justice for human trafficking victims. And these cases should be treated or addressed with an intersectional perspective. Women's Link considers that this ruling by the Constitutional Court is positive. Also, we would like request the Honorable Commission to um, conduct different recommendations and that these recommendations should include an intersectional perspective that takes into consideration the specific impacts on women. Um, for example, last uh, yesterday, uh, the president talked about the possibility of creating a working table in Colombia. And we believe that those strategies are very useful to apply an intersectional approach. Thank you. I would like to greet uh, my colleagues from Women's Link. My name is Marce We Guerra. I'm here on behalf of uh, obligation 
um, Renazar from Colombia and several other organizations from Guatemala and Mexico. And I'm here also on behalf of the Collective Against Slavery. Honorable commissioners, I would like to greet all of you for this opportunity to participate in this hearing. The Inter-American Court on Human Rights has recognized that not being subject to slavery and servitude or forced labor is a right. And it is essential and it's present in the American Convention according to Article 27.2 of the American Convention. Therefore, uh, the right uh, to be protected from slavery is included in the convention. Gender stereotypes in criminal justice systems in the region are leading to generalized impunity uh, when it comes to crimes regarding forced labor. Justice operators, judges, prosecu prosecutors use discriminatory bias that apply discrimination categories based on sex, ethnicity, nationality, age, among others. And women and girls are the most discriminated groups. Bias and gender discrimination and racial discrimination uh, damage the investigation and prevent the sanction and protection of the victims, which are revictimized by justice systems. Also, these gender stereotypes affect the way in which the elements uh, the criminal law are interpreted. And therefore, um, additional elements are requested and the perpetrators are acquitted. And sometimes the, uh, the rulings have no uh, perspective when it comes to the assessment of evidence. We see that this is not happening to women, but also to girls and women adolescents. Girls are not responsible. And they are working. We are concerned about the delays in legal proceedings and investigations. This is a denial of effective justice. We know that proceedings take over nine years until the ruling. And the rulings, when they are um, issued, victims want just to forget what happened and they don't want to know about the rulings. So justice operators lack technical knowledge, have no empathy, and they don't have the abilities to face or the proceedings correctly. States are failing in their duty to due diligence in terms of human rights. States are uh, promoting violence. The state should train public officials, especially those who work in investigation. However, those measures promote discrimination and make it more dangerous. There are several studies by international organizations. For example, migration policies also promote human trafficking. The restriction of borders do not prevent the flow of persons which are who are desperate to leave. This promotes the displacement of persons in illegal ways. The lack of regulation for displacement is um, a benefit for human traffickers. And I would like to give you two examples of how this works. Of what has happened in Chile, there is a case over 40 Paraguayan workers were captured and forced to work in a farm owned by a well-known political uh, business person. All the persons, all those responsible were acquitted in Chile. And he, I have here a part of a ruling. 
all the indicators regarding slavery uh, established by the ILO were there, but everyone was acquitted. And a woman was subjected also to domestic servitude and all those responsibles were acquitted. We see that this woman um, suffered because uh, she did not know Spanish and she was working in the uh, community of Vicuña and she was subjected to servitude and she was in a situation of vulnerability in its workspace and also she, they were exercising abuse against her and she was physically bad treated and she was overloaded with work and nobody was paying her and recognizing or in spite of the vulnerability suffered by that woman, forced labor to which she was being subjected was not recognized by judicial authorities. Now I would like to give the floor to one of my colleagues uh, from Cisma Mujer. Thank you so much. So far, we have presented over 200 cases of sexual abuse against women and we have identified a set of situations that show that there is a lack of gender perspective in the proceedings in uh, the judiciary. Also, there is a lack of understanding of sexual violence, even though the Constitutional Court in 2015 talked about the relationship between the armed conflict and the situations of violence against women, um, the Constitutional Court quoted the international jurisprudence. And this uh, was quoted to establish the relationship between the armed conflict and um, the violence against women it's important to understand that the transitional system is not compliant with these uh, international standards. We don't know why jurisprudence is not taken into consideration. And we know that the constitutional court ruling is a feminist uh, advanced. However, we know that many judges are not being objective or neutral. And we know that they are excluding the progress made by social women organizations in Colombia. So we are seeing a lot of gender stereotypes in judicial rulings. We have also identified a prioritization of some crime behaviors. And for example, cases regarding sexual and reproductive violence are not considered. Taking into consideration uh, what is happening right now, many courts have realized that it's important to establish a gender and ethnic approach in their decisions. However, we see that there are some, a hierarchy established in current proceedings. For example, the territorial approach is being implemented. Also, there is uh, the application of the ethnic approach. However, um, usually courts are resisting opening cases based on sexual violence. However, uh, usually sexual violence is considered a second degree crime. In spite of the disproportionate effect that all this has on women, nothing is being done. In some cases, when some sexual violence cases are being dealt with, they are just left uh, for later. Sometimes the focus is on the perpetrators and not on the victims. And also sexual violence 
cases are only dealt with if there is sexual abuse and other forms of sexual violence are not considered. And this is because violent behaviors against women are not being considered. And what we are seeing is that there is a um, high level of impunity. Uh, it's important that women continue fighting. Also, investigations should be conducted, taking into consideration the women's perspective and their experiences. Also, um, many courts are not recognizing the experiences of women and girls. We request the IACHR to continue talking to the Colombian government to give a response to all these victims who have suffered sexual violence. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Carolina. Good morning, everyone. I am very thankful for being here today. I am Bianca Dos Santos Wax. I am a lawyer and the coordinator of Matos Filio and NGO. Actually, we are a law firm with a hundred percent free area for people in social vulnerability situations. I will be talking together with my colleague Leticia, who is a lawyer and a friend here at my firm. In the past few years, we've been helping women under family and gender-based violence that, coming, that were coming from the DA's office in Sao Paulo. Given our experience in this department, our presentation will be linking the current gender stereotypes in judicial rulings and how difficult it is for women to have access to justice, especially when they need urgent protective measures. As we all know, the domestic and familiar environment is still a very unsafe space for women. 70% of, of cases in 2021 had the author of the violence by someone who they knew and half of them took place at home. The feminist movement in Brazil was able to guarantee several situations of progress like the law Lei Maria da Peña and public policies related to how to confront this violence. Protective measurements, urgent protective measurements were created by Lo Maria da Peña and these measurements are there in order to prevent and help women in situations under gender-based violence situation. Women could go to different different places like police stations in order to file a complaint and the judge will have 48 hours to decide on this protective measure. The only requirement for this protective measurement to be granted is to present elements that could prove the probability of this violence taking place. And sometimes since they happen at home, this is happening, this violence is happening with no one there to see it at home. Therefore, the statement by women sometimes is the only way to prove this situation that they are facing. So based on this, and in order to guarantee the right law interpretation for the protection of women's life, Brazilian courts should pay more attention to women's statements and considering it enough to grant these protective measurements. However, this is not happening in the daily practices of judges in Brazil. We see that they do not trust the women's words. And we believe this is based on the gender stereotypes of women lying or women trying to find revenge through this Maria da Benia law. And these stereotypes are justified by the way in which they don't know how family and domestic law work. They are using examples of women that cannot break this cycle of violence and go back to their husband 
or maybe sometimes they go to a police station without needing a punitive answer, considering that the protection must not depend on any investigation or criminal action. And as a result, a large part of the Brazilian women requesting protective measurements when they do not have any additional piece of evidence more than their own statement are not protected and they could end up being victims of more serious violences. And according to this statement of women, what we see that judges are not paying attention to them. And let me tell you about a case that we took that is very important. This was a woman that was suffering violence for 12 years and she wanted to find these protective measurements in order to be able to find help. Since there were no protective measurements, she left her home and she ended up not talking even to her own children. And the situation of violence was based on her statement. And that's why she was not given any protective measurements whatsoever because judges did not trust her. And we see this happening with many women and young people. For example, recently in Brazil, there was an 11 year old girl that was denied an abortion after being raped. So we believe that judges should believe in women and young girls, especially in order to grant measurements to protect them. Now, let me give the floor to Zoe Verón. Good morning to all participants. My name is Zoe Verón. I'm part of the Latin American team on justice and gender, ELA, from Argentina. From ELA, we systematize sentences on gender-based violence rulings from the last 10 years, analyzing legal arguments used by justice operators from a feminist perspective. In this systematization, we have noted that even though there is a solid normative uh, regulatory framework in Argentina, there are still some pending situations and uh, vacuums or voids that uh, lead to the conclusion that there is no eradication of gender-based violence. There's still impunity in the face of violence acts and also re-victimization of women in judicial processes, which are rooted in gender stereotypes. We also find good examples of how justice can provide effective answers, adapted answers to the needs of each case when justice operators struggle against discriminatory uh, stereotypes and making possible reparation. The judiciary should not agree on having stereotypes to legitimize violence. In uh, defense arguments, there is usually this type of uh, stereotypes. They accuse women of having mental health issues or being uh, bad mothers, of provoking attacks among many other arguments. This defense is uh, reflected in rulings, especially in first, uh, in, in lower courts. When for example, the moment, uh, the, the time that took women to make the complaint is usually commented on. Also, there is situations of re-victimization along the judicial proceedings, which are determining factors for the interpretation of the testimony of the victims themselves and other witnesses. Vulnerability is also used as a case to uh, to put um, the guilt on the victims. 
even today in cases of sexual abuse, there is an idea that for justice and even for the society itself, there are good and bad victims according to the different stereotypes linked to sexual violence. Lastly, I would like to mention that there are situations of revictimization in civil and crime situations. Sometimes they are reverted in and appeals. And as an example of this situation of challenges to revert this type of situations, there was a, a case of sexual abuse and the uh, High Court of the province of Cordoba argued that the intervention of all parties uh, prevents uh, repetition, repetition and revictimization on its part in on a case of uh, economic violence the Superior Court of the province of Chubut argued that removing food allocation for women would constitute revictimization. We will share with the Commission an extended version of our presentation and we thank the opportunity to participate at this hearing. I give the floor to Ana Catiria Suarez Castro. Good morning, everyone. Honorable uh, President, thank you for this opportunity. I'm speaking on behalf of my country, Mexico, and I find it extremely important to have access to a space that maybe it's the only uh, commission that can mediate in the situation of inequality between, between men and women in my country. I would like to tell you that in only one year, there was more than 3,500 uh, femicides. And why? Because victims were women. And in relation with stereotypes in judicial proceedings, we should also know that there has been some advancements in Mexico, for example, the creation of Olympia law, which protects women against uh, digital violence. And also the Fatima law, I was, uh, the representative of the victim, which leads all authorities at all levels, women and, women and men, to uh, train to act with gender perspective. Unfortunately, in my country, the only thing that we get in uh, judicial resolution when gender perspective is requested is the wording and the terms, the vocabulary, but no, not the, the link with the facts themselves. So in order to establish something related to that, I would like to say that for the international communities and for my country, violence against women and girls is a violation of human rights. That is a serious violation. And in this country, this is the start of the violence towards femicides. femicides. Also, there was a case of Julieta. Julieta uh, presented seven uh, complaints to request protection and she presented and, and she faced stereotypes because uh, today Julieta is dead. We found her on a black plastic bag on the side of the road. And this is why I have been telling the Congress of my country that the responsibility of the investigating authorities is serious in the case of femicides. The fact of constantly uh, bringing, um, not taking into consideration the victim's complaints is one of the most serious situations in our countries. Also research is based on scientific mechanisms which sometimes are a crime on the part of authorities. And research has to be presented as evidence at the same level as women's uh, with uh, testimonies. Also, there is domestic violence due to the great economic inequality in our country. Women earn generally 40% less of the wage paid to a man that uh, works on the same tasks. Mexico's society has uh, family violence accepted. Also, in Mexico, 
authorities are not considering uh, dismantling their own masculine mas uh, male chauvinistic uh, perspectives it's highly possible that authorities also commit violence at their home so how can we expect them to have a favorable ruling towards the the rights of women revictimization is also key because the conditions and the protocols when there are gender-based crimes are not standardized in our country femicides is not even rooted all throughout the country as a crime type women's rights are conditioned to what as regards the economic capacity of their husbands or men institutional violence related to gender is very important i want to conclude my intervention by mentioning something that is very relevant i have not heard in my country anyone say to see who are the the defenders because corruption also lies in uh, lawyers in terms of the sentences that favor men who hire them so we should see the responsibility on those who have sworn to uh, to protect justice Also, I would like to mention that I will give the floor to Lucena Garcia and Carolina. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. We are Luciana Garcia and Carolina Ferreira from the Brazilian Institution of Research in Brazil, and we'll introduce data of the advocacy of women and to warranty a partial uh, judgment in a, in the case of a woman of 12 years old. In 2015, the Supreme Court of Brazil re, uh, recognized the, situ the situation of this case because of the lack of health care for this woman and institutional violence. Her case was perverse. She was uh, abused and the consequences are still even worse for pregnant women and women in lactation. The conditions are uh, terrific because of the violation towards the rights of the of children. We need to provide custody to this pregnant woman in spite of the fact that the Brazilian law generated important rights the application of these rights is selective unfortunately as it has been so traditionally in our country the protection of these rights is denied for these women and their rights are vulnerable. so we decided to mobilize ourselves and the problem is that these perpetrators were not uh, granted a sentence of imprisonment and many times women cannot help their children so carolina has the word good morning everyone we wanted to express the constant violation of rights of imprisoned women in brazil the first one was in 2019 it has to do with the collective habeas corpus, and they should protect women that are imprisoned at home. There was a research conducted in five cities in Brazil, taking into account social assistance, health, and these specific rights were not honored for these imprisoned women. Furthermore, the preoccupation with the early childhood has nothing to do with the promotion of rights of these women and their children. The Supreme uh, Federal Court did not warranty the rights of these women. This took us to the second research that came with different uh, situations in case of five women that were imprisoned at home until April of 2021. The defense did not 
provide the necessary information of the provision of rights for these children. These were the results that we received. And of course, they also alleged that there were cases of drug trafficking when they decided to analyze the cases. The Justice National Council approved a protocol in case of uh, gender related crimes to provide a specific tool to analyze these cases. Unfortunately, we still have not received any information of the application of this protocol whatsoever. So we decided to create an inter-American uh, protocol so that the feminist groups could be strengthened. And we, um, we requested for the creation of a council to apply this with a gender perspective. I give the word to the coalition uh, of rights. And I think I thank for the opportunity of participating in this audience today. Thank you, Carolina. Um, I would like to talk to you now about women who are sentenced to death worldwide. Um, especially regarding uh, gender stereotypes and biases that they face. Most likely, women are, are um, likely to be perceived as either victims or perpetrators of crime. And this may be even more true when their behavior does not align with socially imposed gender norms. Women are perceived to be, uh, when they are perceived to be the victims, um, when their behaviors align with gender norms, such as the caregiver, they may benefit from more lenient sentences. In contrast, when they are perceived as the perpetrator of the crime, they're more likely to receive harsher punishment than men accused of similar offenses. This is particularly true for murder. Um, and in the US, several women have been sentenced to death and even executed last year, one woman was executed last year for the murder of her abusing husband. Um, there also intersectional discrimination applying to women. Women from economically disadvantaged and uneducated background are more likely to be sentenced to death. Um, there also, as previous uh, speakers mentioned, an underrepresentation of women uh, in the positions of judges, prosecutors, court administrators, and the likes in many countries. And that underrepresentation is made more problematic in countries where there is the death penalty, where the consequences are fatal. In a recent uh, publication by the Cornell Center on the Death Penalty Worldwide, the absence of women making key decisions over the course of criminal prosecutions may be yet another contributing factor for the justice system's failure to take into account women experiences. Um, women are a minority of prisoners um, and even less a woman sentenced to death and women executed. But the crimes for which they are charged and then condemned to death reveal gender bias for the charges, or at least not taking into account mitigating circumstances that arise from gender bias discrimination. For example, women sentenced to death for murder have often lashed out against an abusive husband or sex offender. Death sentences in the Americas are imprisoned women for the crime of murder, and this case frequently involved the killing of a close family member following gender-based violence. Um, they may be sensitive to um, um, uh, they, they may face significant barriers in access to justice and convincing the courts that they acted in self-defense. Um, and very often these discriminations are interlinked with other kinds of discriminations like discriminations against people with um, psychosocial or intellectual disability. Um, also circumstances prior to conviction are very regularly not taken into account by the courts. Um, the death penalty, in, sorry, the death penalty disproportionately affects the economically disadvantaged and vulnerable, those with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities, members of racial, ethnic, or religious minorities, and for women accused of capital offenses, this marginalization is compounded by gender stereotypes, stigma, powerful and patriarchal cultural norms, and gender-based violence, which has an adverse impact on the ability of women to gain access to justice on an equal basis with men. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna give you one example. Um, the, last, the woman who was executed in the US last year uh, was called Lisa Montgomery, and she was a victim of incest, child prostitution and rape. She was convicted of murder in 2007 for killing a pregnant woman. 
As a result of sexual violence, Lisa developed a dissociative disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, among other mental disorders. At trial, Lisa's attorneys failed to present the full extent and impact of her childhood torture and sexual abuse. Federal prosecutors called the suffering Lisa Andrew the abuse excuse, and instead focus on her failing as a mother, telling the jury that she didn't cook and she didn't clean. She was put to death on 13 January, 2021. I thank you. And I now give the floor um, uh, to um, the next, uh, our next speaker. Um, Commissioners, I think we're still lacking three persons, but the time is not enough, so we will use the time for questions afterwards, and maybe we can reply in, in that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandra. We will add these minutes that... Uh, you were lacking to the next part. So first, Commissioner Margaret McCauley, do you have any questions or comments? We have 15 minutes for the commission. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm sorry that I'm uh, seemingly in the dark, but it's uh, the sunlight is very hot when, when um, the, the blinds are moved up. So please forgive me. Um, I am... Good morning, everyone, and especially my my sister commissioners um, who are here today, and all of you. This has been a very informative hearing. Please forgive me for being slightly late. I had slight connection problems um, because I'm a long way away from from the uh, um, American continent. <laughs> so, um, yes. Um, I, this has been a very interesting and, and, and really informative uh, uh, hearing today, and I thank you all for all the information you've given. I think you've straddled the, the uh, gender stereotyping, um, uh, which exists in a widespread manner all over. Um, there is no country which can say they are free of of, of this problem in our judicial proceedings. And, and um, it's really, um, you've really highlighted the fact of, of judicial bias. I, I, I'm very blunt in my use of language, judicial bias and judicial prejudice. That is basically what it is. Um, because judges like other members of society come with their own baggage of the prejudices that they have acquired throughout their lives and their beliefs. And they forget that when they sit as a judge, they have to remove their personal beliefs and bias and deal with the evidence against them, always bearing in mind the human rights of the person whose case they're, they're handling and, and, and render a just and, and true verdict or, or determination. But we find that they, the bias, this bias and prejudice comes out more in sexual matters, uh, uh, um, which we, women will suffer sexual violence and so on. Uh, and even when they are before them uh, um, 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 on a charge or, uh, um, of, of, even when they're dealing with a, 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 an accused for femicide, they, they forget about the fact that they must be just and listen to the evidence and decide on that and, and deal not with the accused actions, but with the victims, uh, um, so-called failings uh, and, and so on. And even in the case of abusive husbands, when women apply for the custody of their children and for, for maintenance, their thinking is, prejudice, prejudice, prejudice against the woman applicant. And we you would remember the case of uh, um, Atala Rifo, uh, the judge uh, who was uh, a gay, uh, who is a gay and wanted uh, custody of her children back. And what the gender stereotypical comments that were made in that case, including by the Chief Justice of Chile, are we were, um, should should embarrass any judiciary 
uh, um, and thing. But this goes on all the time. So what, what do we need to do? It's not only just to appoint many women judges, because many women bear these prejudices themselves. So we have to choose really properly. And then um, for those who respect womanhood and respect the rights, and we have to ensure that there are clear laws which give them guarantee their security of tenure as judges, every judge. In, in, they must have true security of tenure, so they do not have to kowtow to the political powers and the political prejudices and, and instill the beliefs of whoever the powers that be are. And it is important that we continue to monitor every judge and keep reports about their utterances in the course of proceedings and keep these statistics and use them. And as a lawyer, I am being a lawyer, I have had to deal with bias in, in, in my cases. And I, my practice is I object, I state the reason for my objection to the judge and insist that it's in the record. And therefore, if the judge's decision is biased as I expect it to be, in having shown bias, it, it is a sure successful appeal for me. I cannot say that in, in the courts of, of, of Latin America and Central America, but I can say that in the courts in which I practice in the common law system. So um, we, we, have, we have these basic things to do. And of course, training can help, but it cannot really change the fundamental person. So therefore, we have to do more than train. We have to record them. We have to record all their utterances so that we can ensure that there's justice for all women in the, and by eradicating through the publicity of their wrongful conduct, the biased judge um, statements uh, of the judges when it comes to women's rights. Um, so that is the statement I wanted to make, Madam President, thank you. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank and recognize the possibility of having this opportunity. I want to congratulate first the Commission on organizing this regional ex officio hearing. We are having a lot of information on the situation in the region. And we are well aware that this is a situation that demands social cultural changes. Why? Because these stereotypes are precisely a structural. This is because of what is taught in society. You have explained this so well, uh, everything that has to do with domination, patriarchal structures, um, control over women, the different women who I hear today have explained this and you have explained the different violence to which we are subjected as women. Um, uh, I think that the interpreter confused uh, partiality and partiality, but I would like to say, uh, to mention this and to be clear is that we need to overcome bias or partial courts when it comes to violence against women. And we need to identify those circumstances or situations in which women should have access to justice so that they can demand their rights. Sometimes women do not have access, not only in terms of violence, but also in other areas. 
And in this regard, I think that it's better to highlight what our report on violence and discrimination against women says. The report was published in 2019, 2020, I'm not sure. Um, the report was drafted by the Rapporteurship on Women led by Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay at the time and the Rapporteurship on Children. And we work because we need to address these cultural issues. We need to promote this cultural change. We need to empower girls and boys for that in order to promote this cultural transformation. Today, we uh, need to have protocols, we need to have a thematic report. Those are, of course, very important aspects to address this matter. We need to have a repository with all the rulings, the commission and the court and even national courts have brought this issue to the table. And this shows that judges have a responsibility and that they have to take the gender perspective into account to have arguments as lawyers to have these materials, these reports, these rulings, that is very powerful. And we need to work on that. And I echo para las mujeres y presidenta para que podamos tener esta 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 fórmula de incidir en las in los sistemas de justicia. Es cierto, a veces... So as to have an impact on judicial systems. And there are some laws that were created because of the rulings and the reports uh, of the Inter-American system. And those rulings ne need to be in the facts. And the, the judiciary needs to be present in the facts. And when I'm talking about the judiciary, I'm talking about all the judicial operators because this depends sometimes on public prosecutor's offices. Sometimes they are the ones who are not aware of the situations experienced by women in our countries. So I have one question. Um, I was a little confused and I want to have clarity about one specific issue. I'm uh, looking at my notes. I'm not sure, but my colleague from Colombia, she was talking about the hair unit in Colombia and she was talking about uh, doctrine, and I'm not sure what the HERP, this unit, was doing to address cases involving women demanding justice. I'm not sure uh, what she was talking about, but I think that it's important that we understand how this procedure works. The commission has worked together with the HEP and there is a commitment. We have some uh, cooperation agreements. And I think that this information is very important. We need to have that information and we need to analyze that information to see what's the current stance of the HEP that is against even the regulations of HEP when it comes to gender perspective. So I would like to 
thank all of you for your contributions and I would like to make a conclusion. Women detain and the situation of protection as lactating and pregnant women. And we need to consider also the situation of children who can be unprotected. So we need to identify how we can work. Uh, we know that provisional detention is an alternative that prisons are the last resource, but when it comes to criminal proceedings, the first decision that is made is prison, is detention. And uh, because of gender stereotypes, uh, lactating women's conditions and pregnant women and children conditions are not considered. So we need to identify specific actions to highlight what human rights violations of these women and their children means. We need to give an answer, to give a response in terms of human rights. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, everyone. Now I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Roberta Clark, and I will skip some comments towards the end of the hearing. Commissioner, you go ahead. Thank you uh, very much. Um... Uh, Commissioner Mantia, and good morning, everyone. So happy to be uh, here with you. I've been working in this area, I would say, conservatively for 20 years, including doing so much training and capacity development with judges and judicial dialogues of judges addressing exactly this question of uh, ending gender stereotyping in judicial uh, decision making. And so it was really disheartening for me to listen to this conversation and to see how far we still have to go. Now, I suppose we, I should not be surprised, even though I am disappointed, because it is, as all of y'all have said, we are still living with the structural causes of gender stereotyping, and that's those structural causes include um, the, the resilience, unfortunately, of patriarchy and patriarchal power relations. So we have that undergirden that we still have to confront, and that undergirden infuses or that cause infuses uh, all of our human interactions. We're all gendered beings and so too are judges. Uh, and so we have to be thinking about how we strengthen uh, not only the continuous um, capacity development of judges, but also the monitoring and the accountability framework so that there are consequences for perpetuating harmful gender stereotypes or gender stereotypes that constrain and restrict women's human rights. Often judges will say, but you know, this is the law and there's not much I can do. I have to interpret the law strictly. But we know that there are degrees of judicial activism. And, and, and so it, getting judges to understand that we are watching them for how they understand the international obligations, whether it's under CEDAW, whether it's under the Inter-American Instruments, including um, the Belém do Pará Convention. Judges need to understand that they are being scrutinized for compliance with, with their obligations for um, impartial, non-biased, uh, gender-sensitive judging. So I would say that we spend a lot of time talking about violence against women, women in the, the, in the decision, judicial decision-making process, because I think that the, the stereotypes are most dramatic in that realm. And also the consequences for women of those stereotypes are so dire. And and, um, and 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 means that uh, harms done to women go um, are characterized by impunity. So we focus a lot on on, on gender based violence, which is embedded in, discrimination is embedded in laws, in evidential proceedings uh, procedures, as well as of course in the conduct of the court, whether it's that conduct by the judicial officer, the judge, or the magistrate, or by the lawyers or juries. Uh, who themselves also, for the countries that have jury systems, juries are, are you know, can very much um, be susceptible to the triggering of gender stereotypes to women's detriment. So we know there's all of that, but there are other aspects of law that I think we really have to also pay attention to. Um, labor law, for example, who is defined as worker and what are those rights? 
connected to that, in, and, in, and in particular, sexual harassment in the context of employment and labor law, something I think that you, there's a lot of bias and implicit bias uh, around, but also, of course, um, questions of family law to which uh, Commissioner McCauley has uh, spoken. So there's a lot that we can say about this, but I wanted to ask the, 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 the representative from the organization from, from Mexico, I believe it was Maria Lina Carrera, uh, I have seen a really wonderful um, tool from Mexico. I think it's called the Judi Judicial Decision Making with a Gender Perspective uh, prepared uh, for the Mexican Supreme Court. And it really was, I, I mean, I've used it quite a lot. And in the Caribbean, for example, we also have equivalent, similar protocols, like in Trinidad and Tobago, we have the Gender Equality Protocol for Judicial Officers. So there, there's a lot of that sort of um, elaboration of, of process in compliance with standards um, in some countries. So I wanted to find out in relation to Mexico, how well known is this, um, this uh, manual that promotes um, non-biased uh, decision-making and the rejection of gender stereotypes? How well is it known? And is it being implemented and civil society monitoring how this tool is being implemented? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Le devuelvo la palabra a la sociedad civil para la segunda intervención. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to civil society organizations for their second round of interventions. No sé quién empieza, sociedad civil. I don't know who would like to take the floor first. Hola, buenos días. Good morning. I was not sure when I could take the floor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, to be sharing with you the experiences in Colombia. I'm from Colombia Diversa, and I'm a part of a network of lawyers. And we have been learning how stereotypes work in the case of LGBTI persons. In Colombia, there have been a lot of recognitions of the rights of LGBTI persons. And there has been an emphasis of addressing cases from a gender perspective. Um, sometimes we know that rulings and decisions are permeated by structures that lead us to reject LGBTI persons. We see that violence against this population has not decreased. We see that there are 205 victims of murder and also 103 victims of police violence. Most of the people affected by violence are gay men and trans women. This means that the main victims of aggressions are those who go beyond the binary sex system. For example, in the, during the emergency because of COVID-19 and because of the restrictions that existed, for example, gender-based ID documents for movement. And we see that those persons who um, violated those measures were sanctioned. And usually a person that is uh, different were suffered higher levels of violence and sanctions. With regard to HEP, for us, this is a sensitive struggle because there is not a single case based on reproductive or sexual violence, or there is no single case related to the, a crime related to uh, violence against or related to the sexuality of the victim. This means that the violence in general terms does not cover the sexual violence suffered by LGBTI persons and women. And we know that there is a hierarchy of victims depending on the territory. The cases of people in some places are a priority over others. So depending where you are, you are not in an equal situation for your case of violence to be heard. We also would like to explain some specific 
issues that we have identified regarding access to justice for LGBTI persons. For example, the gender category is related to women, cisgender and heterosexual women. And therefore, there are no tools or investigations with a differentiated approach. Uh, so there is no assessment of gender-based violence against LGBTIQ persons. For example, if a person is uh, publicly uh, considered LGBTI person, that person is attacked. Many discourses um, work or talked about gender ideology, and this leads to the belief that gender orientation is something that can be changed. And in the judicial arena, this, the ideology or the gender orientation is not considered because it depends on the bias of the judge. And since there is a lot of bias, uh, persons are not considered in equal terms. Also, we would like to recognize that there are some stereotypes that persist. For example, they are considered uh, conflictive or provoking persons. And therefore, sometimes they are not considered of interest among judges. Sometimes sexual orientation and gender identity are considered private issues. And therefore, there is no structural analysis to see how gender-based violence operates in these cases. For example, the HEP has no methodology to assess gender-based violence against LGBTI plus persons. And therefore they are not recognizing that in the armed conflict, these cases existed. Also, there are cases in which there is no weighing on the evidence, especially in situations uh, involving LGBTI persons, there is a lot of violence when it comes to the uh, reception of complaints and reports, and there is no evaluation of the context. They are not evaluating the historical violence suffered by these groups. Thank you. So gender stereotypes impact legal rulings that criminalize and deprive women of their liberty in certain crimes. In order to identify gender stereotypes, it's not only necessary to see uh, legal sentences. Once women are deprived of their liberty and have gone through many judicial instances, we see they have suffered many instances of gender stereotype. In Argentina, with two of my colleagues, we investigate cases of criminalization of women due to obst obst um, cases in hospitals where women were reported by uh, medical staff. But this is not only a problem in Argentina. In 2017, in the final observations in terms of the uh, report on El Salvador, the Sedao committee pointed out the problem of incarceration of women who come to hospitals to seek medical attention. We see that sentences are only the final result of gender stereotypes all throughout the proceedings. These stereotypes lead to criminalization and uh, criminalizing uh, decisions taken on women whose role is related to their duty as um, mothers. So these stereotypes related to bad mothers are deepening practices of that are against their right to be heard, for example. This is also the case for women criminalized for cases related to drugs, which is increasing all throughout Latin America. We see the high rates of uh, conduct related to these accusations on women. According to the latest statistics, re crimes related to drugs are the most commonly uh, placed on women and the sentences are disproportionate. This is uh, more serious for women who are involved in, proced in procedures as a result of uh, trafficking of drugs re 
which are really uh, related to their partners. So it, this is the consequence of being a partner or a, a wife of a man that was in re re related to this type of, of crime. So women have been considered co-authors of the crimes uh, placed on their husbands. So those crimes are related to daily aspects of their relationships and not with a specific crime committed by those women. So this is specifically related to the roles of women in their family and at their homes. This problems, criminalization at hospitals and crimes related to drugs are only examples of research based on gender stereotypes. And also these problems affect the guarantee of impartiality, because if we understand that stereotypes are relevant in selecting criminalized cases and the evidence submitted under assessment and all the relate all the decisions taken related to deprivation of liberty and sentences this cannot be separated of the principle of impartiality that must uh, guide all proceedings now i give the floor and the conclusion to alejandra colo thank you very much lina Reproductive rights are human rights. Recommendation number 33 of the DAO committee is clear as regards uh, this type of cases. And this is continuous in justice proceedings. We have seen that this has to do with private life and sexual uh, behavior on the part of women only for the fact of being women and also in relation with the weighing of evidence. In case Guzman Albarracin against Ecuador, the Superior Court dismissed sexual uh, harassment, assuming that uh, Paola had wanted to engage in such uh, sexual uh, uh, activity. The judge acted under the stereotype of uh, this uh, relationship between men and women. This is a stereotype of Latin America, and it was considered that the victim did not need any type of protection due to her behavior, and her case did not uh, require investigation or assessment. In the case Manuela versus El Salvador, which was already mentioned at this hearing, the fight of being a rural woman coming from peasant community led justice operators to think that Manuela was not able to understand the proceedings against her. So this was based on a stereotype uh, which reads that rural women do not have the capacity to act on their behalf. In that same case, there was also another stereotype under which women are always uh, sacrificing themselves for reproduction and that their maternal instinct must, uh, must be the most essential part of their life. So despite this, women having suffered, having lost blood, it was supposed that she had to overcome her situation and she had to understand perfectly what she was going through at the hospital. So the maternal instinct being the most important aspect of this case. So the judge considered that Manuela had acted against nature itself. There are many women who are deprived of their liberty due to this type of violence at hospitals. And this is related to the interruption of pregnancy cases as well. In the case of Esme, as a woman who was recently sentenced to 30 years in prison for this type of violence, a judge considered that she had committed a crime under the stereotype that she is a poor woman, she has no agency, and she is primitive in terms of her own sexual health. The information that she submitted to the hospital was used to convict her. 
the context of criminalization of abortion leads to expanding this type of stereotypes because they affect how med medical staff assist victims and also stereotypes in medical environments impact judicial proceeding, proceedings as well. And lastly, I want to conclude on behalf of all uh, my colleagues here with some conclusions on stereotypes. First, gender stereotypes in judicial proceedings make women and diversities not appear before courts because they think they will be judged under stereotypes and, and they will be criminalized. Also, the weight of ev evidence is affected when there is no uh, unbiased justice operators. The answers of the victims are wrongly assessed. Also, their justice operators use gender stereotypes and make victims uh, distrust the judicial system. There are unjust situations for LGBTIQ person and also women in Latin America to don't have opportunities to access justice. And we believe that our rights are not equal as the rights of the rights. We thank you for the opportunity. We uh, want, we suggest the drafting of that thematic report and we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. We're concluding with this hearing. I want to first thank you not only for your presence here today, but also for the daily work you've been doing for so long and for all of the persons you are representing in different areas, academia, uh, justice, etc. Also, we have taken down no the note of your suggestion on a specific report on this. We are planning our drafting our strategic plan, and here we have Maria Claudia Pulido, who knows that this is a great priority for all rapporteurships. So we note this to to be included in our strategic plan as well. And also, I would like to thank the team of the Inter-American Commission who worked to prepare this hearing, uh, specifically Areli Varela, who was coordinating with each and every one of you and all the efforts that we've made to have this ex officio hearing in the framework of all the hearings and all the activities of the commission. I think this is a proof of the commitment on the part of the commission. I think that by listening to you, we reflect upon the fact that we need to incorporate gender perspective from education so from schools themselves beyond law schools with an intersectional inclusive participatory approach to make visible all the situations all throughout the region including of course the caribbean as well also i wanted to tell you uh, in this time, I will be given uh, one extra minute, I'm sure, um, why we held this hearing, because there are court standards, we have the Manuela case and all other cases, but why did we convene this hearing? Well, to, to set precedent, because this will be uploaded and it will be used afterwards, so that your work is known is assessed is studied and used as a tool for study in law schools and also for for daily work and reflection and also so that each woman and children and girl ha that has suffered each of the stereotypes that you have brought today so that they don't feel that they are alone that they that the denial of justice was not their fault, that, that there is a series of women and artworks who are working to revert that. And also this is for you, for each and every one of you, because you have also suffered that violence, that historical discrimination that starts in, child, in childhood and it continues all throughout our lives. There is continuity of violence and discrimination all throughout our lives and you women, today have also suffered this violence directly. So this hearing is also for you. So that all of us, all of you know that the commission is here to hear you, that to support you. We are the first element towards the, the for entering the system. We are the, the organism that provides hope and we're here 
with our different rapporteurship and that hope is also a responsibility for the commission in order to conclude such a historical hearing i want to remind you of some phrases of uh, the song vivir uh, cancion sin miedo from vivir quintana that says that today women are taking their calm away they saw uh, fear and wings grow out of you. So this is what, uh, why we're here for. The commission, the Inter-American Commission with all the commissioner, commissioners Macaulay, Clark, and Rosamena, and with all the rate, the rest of the collegiate body is always responsible to address this topic. And we hope that this will bring some positive results. Now, I uh, let me adjourn this meeting and thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.